Hello, Rubaina. How are you? Hi, Maya. I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And I'm happy to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time, and I'm happy that I'm seeing you now so we can have this uh, chat about you, about what you do. And I know that you want to also tell us about more, uh, tell us more about um, how it is and your experience working in this profession as a racialized female criminal defense lawyer. But before we get into that subject, I will just let you introduce yourself for uh, our viewers. Those I know a lot of people know you, especially in the Toronto area, but for those who don't, uh, if you can just introduce yourself to our audience, please. Yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you, Maya, for having me here. Uh, it's an absolute honor. Uh, to be a part of this. Uh, my name is Rubaina Singh. Uh, I'm presently uh, working at Scofield Makia and Associates. I am a 2020 call. Yes, I was called in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, I practice um, exclusively uh, in criminal defense. I do uh, mostly trial work at uh, both uh, Ontario Court of Justice and Superior Court of Justice. Um, the firm's practice and invariably my practice uh, the focus is quite a bit on firearm and drug related cases. Uh, I, I obviously do other types of cases as well, like domestic, sexual assault, uh, financial crimes, but the focus is still on firearm and uh, drug offenses. Um, our office is based in uh, Toronto, but we practice all over Ontario. And uh, yeah, that's uh, sort of uh, sums it up. Okay, that's uh, very nice. So now tell us then uh, a little bit maybe, Rubaina, about how you got into this practice of criminal law. I I actually came to Canada as an international student way back in 2013. I was always interested in doing human rights work uh, and uh, international human rights work, and that sort of uh, brought me here. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time during my undergraduate uh, exploring human rights and working with different organizations to see if that's the career path I would want to take. Uh, but I wanted a little bit more uh, stability as far as the profession was concerned. And criminal law was uh, very close to the social justice advocacy component. Obviously, it's, uh, that's what we do day in and day out. Uh, I took, uh, I did my undergraduate degree in criminology and criminal justice with uh, some focused on post-colonialism and uh, international law. And, uh, and after when I went to law school, I always found criminal law the most interesting uh, area of law. And I took a lot of courses in criminal law. I worked with uh, Professor Tanovich. I did uh, a supervised uh, research paper with him. I worked in uh, with different organizations even throughout, uh, including uh, community legal aid. Um, and that sort of uh, solidified my interest in uh, criminal law. And now I've been working uh, at uh, with uh, Kim uh, since 2020. Okay, so you've been working uh, in criminal law since 2020. So that's four years now. And tell us then, so how did you find the practice of criminal law. So I know criminal law in theory is always very interesting. The cases are interesting. The The stories that we hear are very interesting. But in practice, and it's definitely, I mean, as practicing criminal defense lawyers, we can say that it's not as glamorous as it is on TV. But so tell us, how was your experience? How did you find it? Did you find that there were some disappointments? Did you find it challenging? Um, how did you find also maybe through the lens of a, racial, a racialized uh, criminal defense lawyer? Um, I think it's, it's a mix of obviously uh, feeling fulfilled in the work you're doing, but it's a challenging work. It's not an easy area of law. It's a, a full-time job. It's, uh, you know, it consumes a large part of your life. And you really, uh, you really uh, should like it and love it enough. Otherwise it's difficult for you to keep doing this on a regular basis and do it passionately, right? To give, to do justice for your clients. So um, I think obviously as uh, all young lawyers experience, initially you have a steep learning curve and uh, you know, so, and you're exposed to you know, litigation and you know, you get that experience for the first time. So obviously it's much more uh, 
uh, rough, but as as kind of the years go by, it gets somewhat better. <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't think it all, ever gets easy, but uh, it starts getting a little bit better. Um, and the added layer of being a racialized person, and, and I would add being an immigrant too, um, that sometimes um, obviously uh, makes you feel more highlighted um, in the treatments that you may receive, right? Uh, you may receive, um, you may feel that you're being subjected to differential treatment uh, between you and the other justice system participants. So I'll give you an example. Um, I did this uh, racial profiling trial. This was still one of the first few trials that I did. So very early on, I brought a very challenging argument. Um, and in the courtroom, um, I'm obviously racialized. My client is a black man, uh, is a black man. And all other justice system participants in the courtroom were white. And racial profiling already is a difficult argument to make. And I commend all lawyers who are doing such great work in being able to uh, you know, establish that in the court and otherwise, because it's not an easy um, arguments to make and uh, be successful in making that argument. So, uh, but what that does is when you bring those kind of arguments, it puts everyone on an edge, you know, like everyone is sort of like angry and, uh, you know- It's almost you, like they're insulted, angry? right? It's like, how dare you raise a, a racial profiling argument? I, I, I absolutely think that, uh, People take it very personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, of course, for officers, it is sort of personal because yeah. they are in that position making those decisions. Yeah, but I mean, we're I accusing them. For other justice system yeah. participants, I think sometimes yeah. uh, uh, they take it very personally. And especially when you're making the arguments, even when, you know, it's not directed at, at, at the opposing counsel or anyone else. Um, and if you're just going based on facts and evidence, what happens? And I... I for the first time, I mean, I've, felt, I've obviously felt this many times, and most criminal defense lawyers feel that you feel alone. You feel like, oh, oh you know, the cards are stacked against you, mm -hmm. being alone in the courtroom. But that isolation that I felt throughout that trial, that's incomparable to any other feeling that I've had and any of the other things that I've done. I just felt, I, I, I used to dread going to the court every single day because I just felt that I was being... Um, you know, they were just being so rude. Uh, the officers were rude. Um, you know, everything was so hostile, which generally is, but it also had another layer to, um, you know, if, if you know me, if you, you've, you've met me, so, you know, I, I'm about like not that tall. And then you have, you know, you have a young lawyer, pretty young lawyer, racialized, speaking with somewhat with an accent coming and bringing this racial profiling. And they're like, how dare you bring this argument? Yeah, that's it's like they don't take you seriously, I, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's how I felt, that I I, I felt that I was not being, take, being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And whenever I would question officers or if, uh, you know, if there was something, a question that was not liked by, you know, other participants, it was almost like, oh, you don't know what you're doing. That's at least how you're made to feel in that moment. And you start thinking that as if you are doing something wrong. Right. That's you start like doubting yourself. You're... You'd start doubting yourself. You start thinking, you start gaslighting yourself. Is this something I'm doing wrong? Am I something saying something stupid? Am I asking wrong questions? Am I a good I lawyer? Wrong yeah. Life? It's like you even sometimes good... question. Yeah. I ask a question multiple times throughout the trial. I mean, I generally do, but like, even especially throughout that trial. Yeah. And it was not just me uh, who noticed that. It was my client too. Yeah. Because I would generally go and speak to him, you know, um, at length after the after the court day was over and stuff. And uh, even he noticed that. And, and I just thought to myself that he's the person who's, you know, who is undergoing a trial right now. Yeah. And if, how he must be feeling. Yeah. If his lawyer, if he if he sees that that's just how his lawyer is being treated, yeah, and that's just so interesting, right? 
and that that's that, that must be such uh, is that must be such um uh, an overwhelming and isolating feeling to be in that position right so, and and just to clarify here uh, rubaina like the point that you're making it's not just the racial profiling argument i mean obviously it's not a very popular argument and everybody is like you said on their edge when uh, someone raises that argument but it's also who's making the argument right like it's the fact that it was you a female lawyer a young female racialized lawyer making this argument like acting like you're smart right like you can make a racial profiling argument and i think that this is what kind of wasn't taken seriously and that kind of irritated people in the court and i i mean i don't know maybe some people think that uh, you know like we're delusional and we're um, imagining things but i don't think we are like i really think that there are some arguments that are kind of reserved to some more um experienced or more you know like worthy people who are considered to be worthy in the profession and some other people it's like how dare you try to make this argument yes and i don't think that has anything to do with you doing a good job but it's hard to understand that and keep that perspective in the moment and uh, you're absolutely right. Obviously, uh, the arguments being made by certain people are given more credence than it would be. Given yeah, they're more accepted, some... right, from That's other right. lawyers. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So um, I just think that uh, even in that uh, moment, and I think merits aside, I, I, I'm not successful. That's fine. That's a side, you know, like we all go through those instances every day where you make arguments and the judges don't agree with you yeah and that's fine but the but there's still some very pleasant to deal with and right you know the opposing people is very pleasant to deal with no one is being difficult with anyone and uh if you have that i mean that's absolutely the professional way of uh you know uh operating but that's just i find i find that somehow when you have such difficult art. And you know what, it was so interesting. I just didn't know if it was just that specifically that argument, was it me or- uh, Both, or a combination. Was, it, was I doing something yeah. wrong or is it a combination or am I just a bad lawyer? I don't know what exactly is going on here, right? Yeah. So it was a very sort of uh, interesting experience that I always remember. Right, um, but I mean, like even, I mean, just putting aside that, experience. I mean, if we just want to get here real about things, I mean, the opportunities and the, uh, uh, you know, the treatment is different. I mean, I think we we will be, will sound delusional if we were, you know, saying that, oh, there are equal opportunities in this profession when there clearly are not equal opportunities uh, in this profession. Uh, there are some people, you know, just by virtue of being connected to other, uh, you know, like judges or lawyers have more advantages in the profession than people who have a weird name that people don't know how to pronounce and uh, they have no idea where they're coming from and who they are. So, uh, I mean, have you not felt that? Like, don't you see it? Don't you feel it in the practice of law? Oh, absolutely. I came from no connections whatsoever. I, bear, I had no... Yeah, you were not born here, here right? Yeah. I was born here, but I also didn't move with my family. So that mm -hmm. is also a little different experience because sometimes when you do move with your family, you have a little bit of that psychological support. And that's not yeah. to invalidate anyone else's experience. I'm just strictly speaking with respect to obviously what my experience has been. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's any easy for them. Um, but obviously I'm still privileged in the ways that somehow I've still been able to navigate my path myself. Uh, I, I was always working twice as hard. I just never felt I could ever ex like, you know, uh, you know, I, I worked on campus jobs. I worked, you know, in the libraries, I did volunteer work. I felt I had to keep my grades up. I had to always be you know, on top so that I don't give anyone an opportunity to turn me down. Mm -hmm. And you still would get turned down. Yeah. And you would not understand what exactly you are doing wrong. Right. You're doing everything you're expected to do. Right. And that's not to say that you don't find people who are supportive. I've had wonderful professors and mentors and friends who have supported me along the way and helped me get the opportunities, which I would have probably otherwise not got. Uh, but at the same time, and I know that there are lawyers as well in this profession who 
make uh, you know efforts to uh, you know specifically uh, hire people from like you know uh, more diverse backgrounds, and they consciously make that effort to create that space for uh, uh, racialized individuals. But uh, that's that's not the tone of the entire system. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so interesting to see when I did go to law school as compared to my undergraduate degree, uh, the kind of, the amount of rejection I faced was so strange. I just could not understand. Mm -hmm. I just could not understand what I was doing wrong. My yeah. marks were good. I had good research papers. I worked with law review. I uh, had very good references. And I know when I was going to the interviews that I knew what I was saying, you know, because you yeah. come and discuss at least with someone else just to make sure because the things can go wrong one time. You can go two times, two times, three times, four times. But like, you know, when there's that unspoken silence in the room and you both know what it is. And, yeah. and you know, when you have that feeling and, you know, I'm just like, I, I. I know I'm just not going to get it because you, you know that it's just like yeah. unspoken. It's just, it's there. It's present. It's so heavy. Right. Yeah. Um, so I've definitely had a lot of those moments. Um, strangely, when I came to law school and I was uh, I was sort of interviewing or competing for opportunities in law school than it, I did otherwise, um, which I found very, very interesting because, you know, with the legal system, it's supposed to be just, yes <laughs> not what we see every day but you know uh, I've, uh, I've I've grown out of uh, that naive mindset for sure yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean it's something that uh, just like uh, just like you said uh, the justice system is supposed to be fair and unfortunately I mean um, I mean we're part of the system we work in it and we ourselves don't feel that justice so then it becomes uh, a challenge right like when you have to defend someone else's rights and you want to make sure that justice comes from them on the other hand we understand more than other people how unfair it feels when you're not getting fair treatment so we totally relate with people when we're defending them because we maybe feel that as opposed to other lawyers who are always privileged who didn't have to go through the things that we had to go through and so I find like it gives us this extra fuel sometimes in defending our clients because we know exactly why they're being treated so like for example this black client that you were defending uh you were getting this racial you know treatment um and that was probably what he was going through when during the arrest and during the you know like the whole police interaction so you know like it, it, in a way you kind of totally understand how your client is going through and it gives us at least that advantage is that we know and we understand you know like the advantage of being a racialized lawyer in many cases is we understand their language. We understand their backgrounds that other people don't, that not even the judge understands. Um, but it's, uh, it is it is uh, unfortunate that we're not getting sometimes the same treatment. And it's still, uh, we see it, we feel it all the time. But do you feel like that there is a change, Rubaina, or do you just feel like you just got used to it so it doesn't bother you as much as it used to before? So what is it? Like, what is going on? I think it might be a combination of, and it also mm -hmm. depends if exactly you're practicing of what jurisdiction you're in, because obviously uh, the, the diversity is a little different uh, across different jurisdictions. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think one component is obviously you, when you're uh, in law school, you're a law student, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, you're in general, you know, faced with your overwhelm, you're nervous, you want to get uh, you know, placements, article placements. And I think the the way you view the job market in the world is very different when you're in law school as compared to when you start practicing, at least for me it was. Um, and uh, so while I think that um, I definitely see uh, a change a little bit in the past two, three years than what I have noticed or felt before, because I've uh, seen job postings uh, on CLA job board regularly where, you know, employers 
uh, indicate that they are seeking a candidates and preference will be given to candidates from equity seeking groups. Uh, and they are specifically indicating, you know, all people from all diverse backgrounds are encouraged to apply and, uh, you know, racialized and people of color um, are encouraged to apply. And, you know, when you see those kind of job postings, obviously it's an encouragement uh, to people to see that that effort, that thought has gone into creating that and people are actually, I mean, obviously it's, uh, people can do that and the interview process can still be very different. Uh, right. And we see all of that's yeah. also reality. That's At another, city, that's another after... problem, right? Like also there is saying, you know, all the right things doesn't mean that you're doing the right thing. So there are stories like, you know, that support both. So this is, I don't want to say that everything is bad because I know personally I've seen like there's a lot of good work and even my own friends and, uh, you know, colleagues who have made that extra effort and have gone above and beyond to ensure that. Whereas mm -hmm. you still hear other set of stories where you know that it's mostly a lip service and yeah. actually in practice, it's not being done. Um, and I mean, I'm speaking again, like from the defense bar perspective, because obviously if I'm ever in a position that I'm in, you know, um, I'm an employer, I, I would want to make sure that the person I'm hiring uh, does not go through the same kind of experiences I went through, right? Mm -hmm. We all try to be mindful of that. And similarly, I know that maybe a lot more racialized people are now becoming entrepreneurs, having their own practices, having their own business. So that may be another way of changing uh, the trend. Uh, and I think that it may be moving in that direction a little bit, but this is again, uh, speaking str uh, strictly with respect to the private practice. And uh, obviously you have uh, the other the government jobs and stuff uh, they work they, they work I, i'm not able to give more insight i think we all see um how the recruitment uh, recruitment happens there but you do see a lot more um diversity even in uh even in those positions now depending yeah. on the jurisdiction you're back yeah. yeah i mean like it's slow we do see a little bit of change but still i mean like i think it, it really is it, it feels like it's more um I mean, it's a mentality change, right? I mean, uh, people have to change the way they they view other uh, people from other cultures, their education, because there's also judgment, especially if you didn't go to the same law schools or if you didn't, you know, study in the same schools and they don't know you, the professors and the lawyers and the judges, you weren't their student. So there is also this kind of uh, judgment, uh, negative judgment towards those who came from other systems. I mean, you were I wasn't uh, born and raised here. I wasn't born and raised here, but I did go to law school here, but not in Ontario. So that too, at the beginning, it's like when you're from a different university, it's like, okay, like who, like we don't really know <laughs> the courses there. So, I mean, there are multiple levels of obstacles and challenges that can present themselves to uh, racialized lawyers. But what are some of the things, Rubaina, because I mean, I understand there are lots of obstacles, but I don't I don't like to be uh, pessimistic. <laughs> I mean, there are some things that are good on the other hand. So maybe one thing that you can uh, help viewers, especially the newer lawyers who are watching, who are inspired by what you're doing, who see that, you know, at the end of the day, you're able to work in a really good firm with a very respected and very well-known criminal defense lawyer. Kim Schofield is known uh, for her work, especially in drugs and guns cases. Um, so what are some of the things that you did or you feel like have helped you overcome some of these stereotypes and barriers and difficulties that you had to deal with? Um. To be honest, I, I think as uh, as funny as it sounds, uh, to not get your in your own head sometimes and just uh, just try, because even when I, I, the most of the opportunities that I got were is because I just I just went and applied. I just I know it sounds simple and and it's not that simple and a lot of people don't hear back and don't get answers and stuff, mm -hmm. but. I would always apply to those opportunities. I would be on a lookout. So for example, uh, you know, when I knew I wanted to get into law school, uh, when I was in the undergraduate degree, so I would get involved in programs. I wanted to train myself. I wanted my resume to look in a certain way. And that was obviously not to just for 
uh, appearance purposes. I was I was obviously participating in the causes and the organizations that were meaningful to me, but also with a focus knowing that where your direction is, having knowing where you're going with things. So having a little bit and and then again, talking to people, reaching out to mentors. Uh, there are a lot of organizations nowadays uh, that offer mentorship, uh, you know, uh, services and programs. CLA has a mentorship program. Saba has a mentorship program. I know Wicked Cable, has a mentorship but... program as well. Yeah. Yes. So all all of the or these organizations have yeah. mentorship programs, and I have you know been fortunate to be connected with amazing mentors who have guided me both in sort of. Uh, you know, guiding me both in terms of like how to go about get obtaining opportunities uh, and even in terms of my work. So uh, I, I would say that you can't do it alone. You have to yeah. sort of reach out to people for help and you have to reach out to people for guidance. And I regularly do that. I regularly, uh, you know, um, uh, seek out that sort of mentorship from other people. And when it's your time, you pay it forward, right? Right. So I think that's been the biggest, I think, uh, strength uh, is I, I know it can be a little intimidating and not everyone feels comfortable reaching out to people. That's why if you join such programs, uh, it puts you in touch with those opportunities, which you may not necessarily go on your own and fetch those opportunities. And uh, Rubana, have you found that female uh, lawyers uh, were more receptive and more helpful than male lawyers in the profession? What was your experience? That's a very good question. I think I've generally felt myself more um, inclined towards and aligned with obviously strong female uh, you know, leaders and mentors, but that's not to say I've not had supportive male mentors. Uh, I've had, I have found support in um, a lot of male mentors as well, but uh, I think it's just a matter of time and opportunity and who you end up connecting with. But mm -hmm. yes, I think if I, if I sort of compare to uh, the female mentors I've had as compared to the male mentors I've had, I definitely have had more female mentors than male mentors, but that's not to say I have not uh, got support from male mentors. And the female mentors have been supportive, right? Like, because I mean, usually the, uh, what we hear is that females tend to become very competitive among each other and they try to put each other down. And honestly, I mean, we're not seeing, you know, especially, I mean, I can say through Wicked, it's been a very positive environment. Um, the listserv has been very, you know, lovely and friendly and we don't have fights and we don't have arguments. Uh, so uh, I just feel like there is a very supportive female uh, community in the defense bar. But maybe I'll just let you say that's my impression. Just let me know if <laughs> you've been feeling the same thing as well. And I think it absolutely, I think it goes like you will find a few here and there where you reach out and you don't get response or yeah. you don't get, but people are busy too, you know, yeah. from defense is a very busy practice. Sometimes it's not personal. People are just busy and it's not intended towards you. Uh, and I can say that because I know like a lot of people sometimes reach out to me and it's not that you don't mean to help people. Sometimes you have a lot on your plates, right? And people try to communicate as much as possible. I, I would say I've had negative experience in terms of any women, female mentors kind of not being supportive. I think whether that's Wicked or being through the mentorship program or in general, having a few uh, you know friends and colleagues that you regularly reach out to and call. Um, I think I've generally found uh, support in them uh, in different ways. And sometimes you find support in unexpected ways as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I actually can't think of a, a negative experience where I've had, like, you know, when I reached out and someone just, you know, absolutely did not uh, uh, help me. But uh, at the same time, yes, I've had people not respond to me, but uh, I assume that people are just uh, busy and it's not personal. <laughs> Right. I mean, uh, also, I mean, people can't always answer uh, every single email. Some people, like you said, are very uh, busy. So it's totally uh, understandable. Um, and um, just 
to get your uh, view, Rubaina, on things. So do you think that things are getting better for racialized lawyers right now in the practice? Or do you feel like it's the same? There's no progress? Or how are you viewing things? Because, I mean, you've been practicing now for four years. Uh, you're in the GTA, which is also, a, I mean, there is quite a diversity as opposed to the East region, which tends to be a bit more, uh, like, less diverse as it is in uh, Toronto. Uh, I mean, you guys also have areas like Brampton, where it's very right. diverse. So but do you feel like things are getting better? Do you feel or worse? Or is it the same? Um, what is your impression on how things are? I think it's a combination. It, some things are definitely getting better with, again, more uh, you know, racialized individuals getting involved in leadership roles or mm -hmm. being part of organizations and taking that kind of initiative to support other, uh, you know, uh, colleagues or younger uh, uh, racialized lawyers. Uh, but at the same time, from time to time, from other justice system participants, you'll 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 have a few experiences that makes you question uh, why am I being still asked that question? You know, the, you know the classic being confused. Uh, with being an interpreter, that's you get that so many times. I don't understand. Your Zoom name says counsel. I'm not sure. Or what student. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or student where your principal is. And then um, I think I was telling you the story before uh, about uh, I was doing this case where I was in a heated cross examination with a, a booking sergeant who was giving me very sassy responses, and uh, we broke for lunch. And you know when you get like really works up yeah. right after have, having a hot exchange with an officer so I just like you know went and sat on the table and uh, the, the clerk wrong time wrong question comes comes up to me and asks me oh by the way uh where are you from where's that accent from <laughs> I'm just like I don't need that question right now <laughs> and it was coming from a place of you know just generally being curious and I just felt it was more like as if I was being scrutinized, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm, then you start thinking, what was I saying during my cross examination that made this person ask me that question? And then you start, you know, thinking to yourself, uh, he came and asked me that question. Was the judge thinking the same? Was the crown thinking the same? Was the witness thinking the same? Uh, was the witness responding to me in a nasty way because he thought that? You know, that's those and, unnecessary on, Exactly. I mean, like, what difference does it make at the end of the day for the job? I mean, I... It doesn't, it doesn't but you know that, uh, you know, the accents which are not generally North American accents, and there are certain accents, you know, uh, which are more frowned upon than the other accents. Yeah. And definitely had situations, because those these are stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. Because that, that doesn't tell you anything about the person, but often based on certain accents, uh, there are assumptions made about you. There are assumptions made about your capability. There are assumptions made about what uh, you're able to do and what you're not able and to do. And how seriously you're going to be taken, yeah. Exactly, how seriously you're going to be taken. Obviously, that doesn't cover anything about your educational background, where you went to school, what your upbringing is, what kind of exposure you have had, all of that doesn't matter because it's a stereotype. That's just not what they're thinking, right? So uh, I, I just found that so interesting. And, and I know that, you know, I do have an accent, but it's not a, a very thick accent. At least that's what my my friends always remind me. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you, when you have such experiences, it's hard for you to not think about those things. It's mm -hmm. hard for you to not be, I don't know if I... The term sensitive but I guess it's not it's hard for you to not be you know um sort of have it at the back of your mind right uh and and in that moment obviously at the end of the day uh you know I, this is not the first time I've experienced it so you build your coping mechanisms because at the end of the day I do not want anything coming uh in the way of me doing my job you right. know so I'm like why are you wasting your time thinking about this? At the end of the day, this doesn't matter, right? Like I Exactly, and it's not relevant. Time. I mean, who cares where you're from? I mean, at the end of the day, what matters is, are you doing a good cross-examination of the officer? That's the question that should be asked. Not where are you from or, you know, like, uh, where's that accent from? Like, it's just so irrelevant. 
Yes, and I think it was just interesting. I was just like, I wasted a few minutes of my time just thinking about all these yeah. other scenarios. <laughs> I could have spent actually yeah. preparing. So, uh, but it's it's actually it takes practice and your time to you know uh, know how to shift, bring yourself back to the focus mode, and like you know, like cut the noise out, focus on what you're supposed to be yeah. doing there, and that <laughs> and uh, what you're there for. You know, but it takes time to kind of get there. So, so if you the your and the answer to your question, you know, have things changed and uh, are things better or are the same? I would say yes, we have improvements from. But for time to time, you see, uh, you encounter, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, such situations. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, right? I, I, there are so many other um, lawyers who come from different countries and or who, you know, whether they've done their law here or they're internationally trained. I'm sure who go through a host of different uh, experiences and, you know, are, are exposed to different stereotypes. And uh, the sad part is I feel like some of it, I don't know if it will go away. I'm not sure, you know. I mean, I, I don't think it will go away, to be honest. I don't think so. But uh, hopefully it can get better. I mean, I like to be optimistic and think that things will get better. And the thing is that we can say is that you've been practicing now for four years, but you're doing a really good job. Um, I mean, I, I follow you on social media so I can see your progress and I see how, you know, like you're you're doing well in your cases, you're winning cases. And at the end of the day, who cares what your accent is and what you look like, where you're from, you're doing a good job. And that's what matters, right? At the end of the day, that's what the clients only care about is, are you representing them to the best of your ability? And you are. And this is what is so nice to see is that despite all the difficulties and the challenges that you're still doing really well and you're getting better and you're shining and that's what matters at the end of the day and honestly like I mean I know you mentioned this a little bit at the beginning of this interview Rubaina but it is very difficult when you're far from your family and you have to do this profession because it is a very tough job anyone who does criminal defense knows how hard it is and uh, you really need to have a strong support system. So when you are away from your family, your roots, your community, it's very difficult. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, you know, like just to, to see that you compare to someone who's rooted in their community and who's doing well and striving and you're doing the same thing while you have to still overcome other obstacles, just, you know, like you get... 10 more points in my view, because you have more things to overcome in addition to having to become a good lawyer and to do the work that you're doing. So I'm very proud of you. And I really, you know, like, uh, enjoy your friendship. And I just love following you. And uh, I wanted to thank you for taking the time today, because I know you're you're very busy. You're still in the office. And, um, you know, like it's summer. Nobody wants to work. <laughs> Everybody's distracted by the nice weather. But you still took the time to chat with me today. So thank you so much, Rubaina. This was a very lovely interview. And thank you for sharing with us your experiences. And uh, please come back again for another interview. I'd like to chat with you more about other cases and other court experiences. And maybe we'll talk one day about one of your cases, actually, like that you're uh, working on. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maya, for having me and for your kind words and for your support. I really appreciate it. And I know no one can do this uh, alone. So having whatever that support system looks like, it can take, it doesn't have to be a conventional support system. And uh, and it exists if you look for it. Well, and on Wicked, we do have a support system. So anyone who's watching, I recommend that you join us and uh, you become a member. If you are female or female identifying, join us, please. Thank you, Rubaina, once more. Thank you, Maya. Very nice to see you. Nice to see you too.